This episode of Sewing with Threads is sponsored by Foff Sewing Machines. Only you can realize your creativity, and the Foff Performance Icon delivers the best tools to let you achieve unparalleled results. Every detail of this sewing machine is crafted to emphasize your artistry and dedication. Sew with the advantage of advanced features and streamlined efficiency. Be perfectly empowered with the Performance Icon Sewing Machine. Go online to pfaff.com today to find an authorized FAF dealer near you. Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, the editor of magazine, Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by senior technical editor. Hi, I'm Carol Frazier. And our managing editor, production. Hi, I'm Janine Clegg. And our special guest, Katrina Walker. Hi, I'm Katrina Walker. Welcome, Katrina. Thank you for being on Sewing with Threads. Katrina is a sewing designer, a teacher, and a machine embroidery expert. She teaches online and at numerous quilt and stitching expos. Plus, she serves as a brand ambassador for Foff Sewing and Embroidery Machines, as well as a sulky thread socialite. Katrina has always been fascinated with natural textiles and unusual construction techniques. She's shared that passion in articles she's written for Threads, including one in our November issue on machine embroidering on velvet and a beautiful cover garment. Oh, thank you. Be sure to also check out her Taunton Workshop videos, Sewing with Wool and Sewing with Silk. And Janine, you have the questions for our special guest. Ooh. I do, I do. Every episode, we start by asking our guest a few get-to-know-you questions. So I'll start with the first. Who taught you to sew? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, you know, I think it's a genetic thing. You, know, you you run into people all the time that like to talk about it being a multi-generational. And I, it definitely in my family, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a multi-generational DNA embedded type of hobby and not even a hobby a passion be wrong to call it a hobby but I think I think my oh great great grandmother was a um, professional tailor in fact I believe she went to people's homes and was hired to be a seamstress she would stay with the family and actually make their garments for them like make their wardrobe for them um her or her mother, you know, it's hard to get them, it's easy to get them mixed up, but just, it's a long way of saying that I learned from my mother and, and she, um, by the time I came along, it was not, she wasn't sewing as much, but I learned a lot by osmosis. Not everybody enjoys teaching, but she was very patient and I at least learned the basics. And then later on, she was great about really supporting my sewing in terms of buying me fabric, buying me patterns, all those <laughs> things. And for me, I'm a very self-directed learner. I pretty much learn compulsively. And so it would, that was enough. That was enough for me. And then, then as an adult, I was lucky to be able to uh, train with Patty Palmer, you know, mm -hmm. become a, a fit instructor for her. And I took some wonderful pattern making classes and illustration classes from a former uh, Vogue Patterns pattern maker. Mm -hmm. And so that was really great because I'm a very practical person. And so, you know, I like to learn from someone who has a very straightforward, no-nonsense approach. And she definitely was that. And I, I'm sure that there was it was a summer classes, and I'm sure I drove her absolutely insane asking tons of questions. But it was like I'd saved them up for so many years to be able to finally pester somebody about it. So, you know, you have to make the most of your opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. And all those years of learning, did yeah. you discover a favorite sewing term? A favorite sewing term. Hmm. Well, you did warn me that that might be a question you would ask me. And, and I, I gave it some thought because, you know, I mean, like one of the first words that jumped to mind was, you know, understitching. It's like, well, heavens, you can't say understitching for a favorite. And I have to say, so I think the, you know, favorite sewing term, I'm going with ease. <laughs> I like oh, nice ease because yeah. yeah. you know ease we've got wearing ease we have easing one fabric into another mm -hmm. you know and don't we all need more ease in our lives <laughs> I just <laughs> you know yeah. so <laughs> we do so you know it's like this, as I thought about it you know ease I'll go with ease all right but I like your runner up under stitching. Well, you know, I love and you know, under stitching. It's such a just unsung hero. You know, you have to really support 
you know, those 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 techniques that, that don't get all the glory, like the top stitching and and you know the the bindings and the you know. Oh, we've all talked of about things. it at least two or three times on this podcast. Really? Yes, yeah. we have because yes. people are. Uh, yeah. It, oh, it, I'm it's, so it's, grateful. It's not discussed enough. It isn't yes. because you know nobody ever sees it. And the poor right. thing is just laying there on the inside of the garment right. without being doing truly, its job. Yes, it right. is. So God bless under yes. stitching. <laughs> All right. So what are you currently sewing? What am I currently sewing? Usually, you know, five or six different deadlines that are stacking up at home that I'm trying not to stress out about. But the one per well, it started out was going to be a project for uh, another major project, but. It'll probably never happen. So, but it's sitting on my dress form cutout. So it's a uh, Byron Lars. I love Byron Lars blouse patterns. They don't do them anymore, but they, I think they're from what the early '90s, early mid '90s. Mm, I think maybe. Byron Lars yeah. Yeah. was a yeah. Vogue pattern designer, mm -hmm. or at least they paid him for yes. their his, for his the patterns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, however that process works. But anyhow, it's a it's a Byron Lars pattern, and it's it's so fabulous because well, I mean, everything he does is fabulous, but it's the bottom portion is kind of structured and pieced so that it's almost corset-like. Mm -hmm. So there's a center panel. It's princess, princess lines, kind of a center panel down the front, and then kind of around the back, a, a corset-like section. But then the sleeves and the back yoke, there's a, um, a fitted back yoke through the shoulder area. But then the center section in the back and the sleeves are all put in in one shot. And that's gathered into the back yoke and into the bottom. So you have this loose, fluffy kind of section that you can use chiffon for. Or I have, of course, a Liberty of London crepe to sheen that all I could get was like a, a yard. But I thought that I can make that out of that. I can get a yard out of a yard. So um, and so then the structured parts, the color and the less important parts are... Um, Silk Dupioni, of course. So, <laughs> which makes yeah. them look very important. Oh, of yes. course, of course. But I mean, I love that pattern because you've got you have such interesting contrasts of design elements. So it's on one ha hand, it's very much flattering to the female form. There's a lot of curve to it. It really kind of emphasizes the waist, but it's not constricting through the bust. You don't have to do a ton of bust adjustments because that the the gathered section in the back is very forgiving for say prominent backs or wide backs and things. So it, it's, it really fits fairly nice for something that looks like it's somewhat body conscious. And then of course you have a section part of it really works well with your fabrics that have more body to them. And then the other part works well with really fluid fabrics. So I just, I adore it. I adore that pattern. I, I was lucky I found another copy on either Etsy or eBay. I was going to ask you where you yeah, found where it. Yeah, where did I find yeah. it? Yes, well, I know now, of course, everyone's going to flood with questions about where did you get that pattern. But I did actually find a brand new other pattern. And they are out there, ladies and gentlemen. Just, are, if you just are you all right Google. with us putting the actual number in the show notes? Oh, yes, completely, completely. Okay, so yeah, check yeah. the show notes for this Let episode. Let the hunt begin. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the next question. What is your favorite fabric to sew? And you had a lot that you mentioned well, <laughs> for that garment, so. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm i pretty much, anyone who, who knows me at all knows I'm a complete textile junkie. So it's so hard to narrow it down. And I think if I could just say one, you know, what kind of fabric had to narrow it down, I'd say critter fiber. Mm -hmm. Basically anything that used to move around on its own pretty much makes me happy. So, mm -hmm. you know, silk, wool, mohair, alpaca, you know, I haven't had the chance to sew with Vicuna yet, but, you know, maybe someday. And, and uh, but, you know, critter fiber, mm -hmm. that's because it has its own life. And I like there's that something very, yeah. something yeah. very special about it. You know, those protein fibers, they just, you know, they wear so well, they breathe, they're comfortable. I love them. And I raise sheep, so you know how can I not like critter fiber? Right. <laughs> I've got it on the hoof. Yeah. <laughs> I've always felt that there's an element there of they were created, designed to protect that creature from the elements. So why not? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, what possible explanation can there be for the silk moth? I mean, the modern, I mean, granted, granted they've been domesticated for 5,000 years. So the Bombyx mori moth doesn't doesn't bear any more resemblance to a wild silk moth than a Holstein heifer does to a wildebeest. I mean, they really are very yeah. different creatures after 5,000 years of specialized breeding. But I mean, we're talking about a little, uh, a moth that comes out, emerges, has a party, lays its eggs, and dies. I mean, it doesn't pollinate any. You know, normally moths pollinate something, or really, at this point, the only thing the silk moth produces is silk for us. 
isn't that the most wonderful self-sacrificing wonderful thing that they do? But you know, it's it's kind of crazy to think that these creatures were you know invented, and this is what they produce. So yeah, they produ- they protect them from the element. But like even sheep, if you don't shear them, it actually is very da- dangerous for their health. Yes. Right. And so again, you know, it, it is pretty wonderful that we have these animals that are so generous with their with their natural mm-hmm. talents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Well, what do you love most about sewing? Um, hmm, what do I love most? It's easier to think of what you dislike about it. But, you know, um, what I love most, it's probably the fact that I will never be bored with it. And, you know, a lot of us with unusual brains, uh, we tend to get kind of distracted easily and we get bored easily. And the beauty with sewing is that I will never run out of things to learn. I will never know it all. I'll never learn it all. I certainly will never sew it all. I mean, no matter how hard I try <laughs> in my stash, it will never be, never be empty. But I think that has to be the most brilliant thing about it. It's, you know, it uses, I have been told it's the only leisure act- activity that uses both parts of your brain or uses, it uses the most parts of your brain of any quote leisure activity. And if you uh, think about it, cause you have technical I elements. See that, yeah. yeah. You have creative elements, technical elements. It's all a, uh, it's easy to see why it keeps us all so entertained. And, and you know, as we more and more we learn about even with aging, how mm-hmm. important it is to keep your brain limber and to exercise all those different parts of those hemispheres. Mm-hmm. I just think sewing is more and more crucial to our long-term health. Yeah. Everyone needs to sew. <laughs> A healthy activity. I love it. Right. Have a good brain. <laughs> sew. Well, thanks, Katrina. We'll take a brief break, and then we'll be back to talk about machine embroidery. Carol, do you remember a story we ran about sewing with feathers? Yes, it was the embellishments department, page 22 in Threads 141, our March 2009 issue. Carol, how did you find this story so quickly? I searched the new 2019 Threads digital archive for the topic. The archive includes almost every article from more than 200 issues of Threads. To find out more about the 2019 edition, visit tauntonstore.com. And Carol, did you know an online version of the archive is now included with Insider Membership? To find out how to become an insider and about all the benefits, visit threadsmagazine.com forward slash insider. Okay, and we're back. And we're talking today with Katrina Walker about what's new in machine embroidery. And Carol, you were in charge of our machine embroidery uh, yeah, stories years and features ago, for years. years ago when we did we did uh, we covered machine embroidery pretty consistently up through I'm not trying to think but at least the mid 2000s and the, I I was in charge of doing of editing those articles and trying to find authors for to cover different topics so I was uh, pretty up to date back then but I haven't done anything since then so my understanding of machine embroidery that what the technology is and and what people are doing with it you know stylistically sort of stopped about. 10 plus years ago. So we need an update now of what's going on. (laughs) Oh my goodness. What is going on? There's just, well, as you say, the techniques and tools continue to evolve. When Mm -hmm. I started embroidering, uh, oh goodness, well, let's just say over 20 years ago, (laughs) uh, you know, even just the basic tools, I mean, the stabilizers and needles and threads we had were so limited. And I mean, I remember people, you know, uh, exchanging because you know, I was in a very or very early adopter of the internet. So even then, on the, like, the Usenet new forums, mm-hmm. you know, people saying, "I use coffee filters." I use, the, you know, it just it was really primitive. Yeah. yeah. So not only have those all come a very very long way, and we have just the most amazing array of of just stabilizers alone, uh, but really, you know, in terms of the tools, um, alignment techniques, you know, we have everything. We have mm-hmm. laser alignment. We have. Um, Scanners. I know um, for our company, we're going to ha- we have um, a new technique. Not well, not only are embroidery machines cloud based. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, my embroidery machine sends me a text mm-hmm. when it needs another color of thread. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask yeah. about that. Or it gives yeah. me a text and says, "Oh, your embroidery is finished." It's like, you know, as I'm feeding the sheep. Oh, great! Thank you very much. No, it's it's good to know that. Uh, yeah, I remember when it was just these little little square disc things that you would stick into the <laughs> machine, or you could maybe get them on a disc. In some cases, there was nothing. Right. There was no Wi-Fi. It was a special card. Uh, yeah, and oh yeah, boy, and and aligning it was a process of photocopying and cutting and gluing it down, and then marking it with all kinds of and different heaven things. 
help and, you if it wasn't straight. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It just seemed like, oh my goodness, it was a lot of work. And then the early machines, many of them had a four by four hoop. Oh yes. And and so everything was sort of a, a motif right here because that's yeah. what you could make. And it, some people yeah. got really good at putting them all together, making more than that. But it it was very hard to design really creatively with that with that limitation. Oh, absolutely. So, and so how big are the hoops now? Oh goodness. Uh, my largest hoops um, for a couple different brands actually is three sixty by three sixty. Okay. We call it the hula hoop. Yeah. Because you can actually oh. step through it. Yeah. Wow. So I mean, what is that? Fourteen by fourteen or something? Fifteen by yeah. fifteen, something like that. It's wow. basically a jacket back yeah. or you know right. a large pillow yeah. or you know what have you. If you look at it in those terms, but yeah. and you know when sometimes I get, I'm commissioned by you know by FOF to do. Um, I'd be commissioned to do a runway garment for them, mm -hmm. for example. And sometimes I have to do create all, I have to create the fabric basically, mm -hmm. um, for their, their garment. It's, it's really nice to have those great big hoops, but, mm -hmm. but it's funny though. Um, you know, I, I do also of course work with Sulky and sometimes design projects mm -hmm. for them. And we still very much design for those four by four hoops because, you know, not everyone can afford That's right, you know, yeah. the big, you have to start somewhere. Well, right. And I don't, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It, yeah. like it would still be a lot of fun. Um, the other question I had for you had to do with software because back then really everything had to be done on your computer with customizing or digitizing software. And now I, I think a lot happens on the machine. Yes. Well, that's, there's, yeah, there's basically, they've made it possible to have two different approaches. Now I'm very much a computer girl, so I mm -hmm. work really heavily in my software, mm -hmm. but it's true on the machine itself. My favorite thing to do on the machine, and it may seem rather mundane, but buttonholes, buttonholes oh, in right. the hoop, because yeah. I can take any buttonhole that my machine can sew, I can pull it up on the screen. I can use the shape creator function. So we have a shape creator so you can create applique and things right mm -hmm. on your machine. And they've, you can make, so you could make, say, a heart that was, um, well, you wouldn't want to do it 360, but at any rate, a very large one. You know, you could do whole <laughs> banners and things and design those right on your machine. But with the buttonholes, I love to take the buttonhole and all I have to do is measure, say, the front of my garment or right. the back of my pillow, whatever it is. Measure it, find out the distance between where I want the first buttonhole to be mm -hmm. and the last buttonhole to be. Okay. Once I have my buttonhole, I bring it in. I say, okay, I want five buttonholes. I want the length of the line mm -hmm. from A to Z. I want that to be, say, 200, 200 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, when it comes to embroidery, I think in millimeters. Yeah. I don't even bother yeah. translating it to <laughs> inches. My apologies, everyone. But but anyhow, so I'll say, okay, I'll get my tape measure out. Okay, it's, it's 200 mil millimeters. And then... Um, I put it in my machine. I use my positioning. So then we have our positioning tools. Mm -hmm. Super easy to make sure everything's lined up. It's all perfect. Mm -hmm. And then boom, hit the button. And I have five absolutely perfectly spaced buttonholes without me having to mark anything. Yeah. And how do you get the garment into the hoop? Do you attach it to a sticky stabilizer so that it's in position? Excellent question. Yes, I, I normally do use a lot of, of self-adhesive stabilizers. Mm -hmm. It, but it just depends on how the garment is going to be cared for. Right. If it's something that won't be washed or isn't mm -hmm. washable, then oftentimes I will just use a very lightweight tear away. Or actually, you can still mm -hmm. use a wash away um, and just take a sponge and just sponge the uh -huh. you know the, any residue off from around the buttonholes in the back. And it's right. it's not a bad thing to actually leave some of that stabilizer right. in the stitching yeah. because it gives the the buttonhole some support long term. Yeah. So I'll do that. And you know, frankly, I've done everything from stickies to actually just pinning it in. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I, was, I will pin it to the stabilizer whoops, if that's what it takes because okay. the main thing is you just have to be careful, obviously. And, right. and if I'm doing something like buttonholes, that's that's a little more delicate operation. I use my foot pedal instead of just hitting go. Yeah, just, just so I can keep oh, a little bit okay, yeah. closer eye on things. <laughs> yeah. You know... You know how it is. It's yeah. like it takes forever to set something up, and then you know, in a moment, in a minute. It, yes. yeah. Don't, don't yeah. rush. <laughs> good. Don't rush good sewing. It just <laughs> becomes painful. <laughs> right. But yeah, it's it's really wonderful the things that we can do mm -hmm. just right on the machine. And what I'm excited about is some of the more, even some of the more physical tools mm -hmm. that are coming out. Um, like for instance, we have a, a ribbon attachment that's launching. I haven't even at this time. Well, when the podcast. Is, is aired, it'll be out. But at this moment, it's mm -hmm. not quite yet. Um, it's actually a mechanical attachment and you wind a ribbon in it mm -hmm. and it goes with certain embroidery designs so that it lays down the ribbon as you're stitching. Oh. And so that's really where embroidery has been doing a lot of advancement too, is very dimensional. 
embroidery. I think, did, oh, I, think yeah. I saw, did you have a sample that you showed us the other day that had zigzaggy well, things the all ribbons, over it? Now that's a, that is actually a sewing stitch that's oh. built into the machine okay. is the ribbon stitches. But this is a, a different like okay. applied ribbon technique uh -huh. that's done in embroidery mode. Mm -hmm. So it's a little faster than, than, I mean, I love the ribbon stitches yeah. on our fofs because, you know, yeah. it's just, it's very zen to sit there and kind of, you know, it stitches it down and then you fold it over. So it's, it's kind of oh, like cool. braiding yeah. hair. It's very yeah. zen. Yeah. But um, I just can't get, wait to get my hands on this. But that's that's really, I would say, you know, embroidery is embroidery. It hasn't changed much for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. you know, basic stitches. But what's really evolved is, you know, cut work designs and applique in the mm -hmm. hoop and um, needle felting in the hoop. And like especially a lot of these dimensional type effects yeah. that we hadn't been able to do before. Yeah. And so, um, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask, how much of an opportunity do you have to experiment? I know you do all these wonderful uh, projects, sort of, sort of on commission or for runway shows. When do you get a chance to experiment? Um, unfortunately, it's pretty much trial by fire all the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> what happens is usually it's like, oh, hey, um, well, it was like a project I did one time um, for another magazine where they. They, they emailed me and said, um, didn't you say that you could embroider on sequins? And it's like, oh, yeah, sure, of course I can. And so then you suddenly find yourself experimenting with embroidering on sequins. And and so it's it's pretty much, uh, yeah, you you know, Sarah, I, yeah, you really don't have time to. <laughs> as much as I would love, I would love to just for the world to stop so, you know, I can have some playtime and catch up with everything. But, you know, that's not how it works. And But so for me, I... I get hired to do the weird, out off the wall. Can you? Is it physically possible to do this? Would you find out for us? That's mm -hmm. kind of the kind stuff of that people hire me to do. So there's, it's just purely trial by fire. And then I have to write about it so that other people can do it too. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> well, now we know who to go to for those kinds of things. Yes, to, yes, yeah. I, I know. Yeah, here comes the. I see my inbox filling up right now. Yes, <laughs> I know. I feel like a suede boot would really like some embroidery on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Why not? Well, you know, now I, I mean, I not only have this thing, I'm, I'm very, very spoiled. So <laughs> I not only do I have single needle embroidery machines, but I also have 10 needle embroidery machines. I love those actually. Those are really yes. fun to and see. So, yeah. yeah. That's where, you know, the suede yeah. boot, you get out your multi hoop set and mm -hmm. because then you can do like a monogram on the top. As long, you don't have to open it up. See? Okay. Yeah. Yep. A yeah. multi needle machine can do free arm embroidery. And oh, so you don't okay. have to necessarily open the seams. Right. And so you can that's, just slide yeah. the boot on there and stitch on your little motif. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so I see mm -hmm. possibly a pair of suede boots <laughs> in your future. Not for me necessarily, but you know. <laughs> darn it! Sorry, Carol. <laughs> well, 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 what else is what else is being embroidered these days? Where where are you seeing it in fashion that people might want to try to um, emulate? Oh my goodness, um, embroidery is every. I mean, it, it's just really everywhere now. Mm -hmm. um, I have two or three pairs of actually embroidered shoes in my uh -huh. possession right now. Uh -huh. um, I, of course, uh, I see a lot of it on jeans, and that's my personal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm wearing a pair right now. Um, not that you can tell, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, that's... Yeah. We'll, put, we'll put a picture in this. Yeah, we'll, oh, take yeah. A <laughs> we'll take a picture, yeah. But, you know, it's, awesome. you know, because, you know, so much of the embroidery I do has to be fancy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not always what our lifestyles lend to. Right. So really, in the magazines, you know, we're seeing everything from, you know, blouses to jeans to just, I mean, pretty much the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, embroidered trench coats, embroidered. And that's actually what makes me really happy because mm -hmm. as much as I adore, you know, beautiful couture, you know, evening gowns and jackets. I mean, sure, I would love to be sewing that stuff all day long. But... It's really fun to be able to appreciate, enjoy your embroidery on something you actually wear, like your jeans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and to be able to, to enjoy it every day instead of just being something that only gets trotted out once in a great while to show off. And and so I'm really glad to see embroidery becoming more of the, how should we say, the day-to-day -day fashion lexicon. You know, it, it's not mm -hmm. just being saved for the good stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and that really makes me happy. Is there a particular style of embroidery that's big? Is there, I, I mean, I remember for a while people were doing a lot of stuff that was mostly outline kind of black work or red work and, mm -hmm. and converting that into, you know, sort of, sort of basic, simple designs, nice, but, but not crazy. And then things got very dense and 
thickly covered and, and where I are think, we now? And, and I yeah. think also people are uh, mm-hmm. people when they think of machine embroidery a lot of times think of just floral designs and that's it. Or or, yeah. or, or yes. maybe yeah. The yeah. Um, which I adore, but yes, the textured yeah. and the more matte designs like cotton yeah, and wool yarns really appeal to me more like cruel work. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's what I was thinking. Yes, when you asked the question, I mean that's the word that keeps c- coming to the sur- bubbling to my brain surface is just texture. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I know I personally am being commissioned to do a lot of work with wool yarns and yes the 12 and the 30 weight cotton mm-hmm. yarn i shouldn't say oh sorry not yarns i should call them threads yeah. um but the the heavier more textural threads i work with a lot of metallics mm-hmm. a lot of so um the biggest challenge with fashion embroidery is that there's always i mean one of the reasons why you're um the running stitch designs the lightweight the mm-hmm. red the reason those will always be popular for fashion is because mm-hmm. frankly there's there's a major challenge to balance out design density, which gives us a lot of detail, a lot of color, a lot have you, with drape. Um, yeah. Because the more, the denser your embroidery design is, the stiffer it's going to right. make the garment. Yeah. It affects the drape, it affects the hang. And I mean, that's one reason I like jeans because I can use some of these beautiful mm-hmm. embroidery designs because if they're a little stiff, it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it does become an issue when we're working with, you know, a soft, lightweight, drapey cotton. You're just going to have to use one of those very lightweight right. open work designs. But that's where, again, the texture comes in with if you're using mm-hmm. your specialty threads or you're using your mm-hmm. your um, cotton and wool heavy threads or mm-hmm. um Actually, Sulky's version is actually acrylic based, but but anyhow, the point is is that that's an it kind of creates a nice way to still get some fill effects and get all that dimensional. And I, I yeah. love and that's why it was fun to do the project on velvet because you know velvet really is fun to embroider, but you do yeah. have to bear in mind that you have a pile to work with, and right. and that's where I'm seeing a lot of trends too. Um, it's really fun to embroider uh, polar fleece and mm-hmm. faux fur and. All of these things, and it's just it, it takes, and that's where those those wonderful specialty threads really help yeah. to bring that design to the surface, so it's not lost. Right? Have you done faux yeah. fur? Oh yes. I haven't seen oh, yes. that. <laughs> I'll have to send you a sample. Okay, How I would you, love to see that. Do you that. put yes. the topper on it? Yes, um, for the faux fur, definitely. I find. Um, Number one, I also use an anti-static spray. So uh-huh. <laughs> oftentimes it's good to hose it down with the anti-static. And then uh-huh. when I I hoop. Um, I'm trying to think. No, I didn't. I didn't hoop it because, of course, I don't want to crush the pile. So again, I'll use a sticky, mm-hmm. um, I use, or I'll use a, a basting stitch. It, it's helpful to take your hand and just lay, lay the pile down very carefully, right. and then you you pull that topper on top mm-hmm. of it in the same direction. So you have to be very conscious of direction. Right. And yes, yeah, so you definitely want a topper um, with with. Most faux furs are washable, so you can use a wash away stabilizer. <laughs> I, I was going to ask about that whether you could wash it off because I didn't realize that you could wash the faux fur. So well, again, it's it. my yeah. job to experiment. So that you don't have to. <laughs> uh, so, yes, so you. yes, so uh, yes, I have found that a lot of faux furs. Of course, what is the mantra? Test first, right? Of course, yeah. yes. of course. Uh, yes, they will hand wash. Oftentimes, the, their their big enemy is heat more than anything. Okay. A little rinse, of course, and a liquid fa- fabric softener helps to restore the hand mm-hmm. and just air tumble it. You know, do not any kind of heat and that acrylic is just going to melt faster than you can blink. So mm-hmm. it's it's crazy stuff. But yes, I have. Um, I actually, mm-hmm. one of the things I've made that I'll finally get to wear this winter because I didn't get it done in time for last winter is a is a long faux fur red fox coat. Mm, that it's pretty darn fantastic. fabulous. Yes. So I, what I embroidered was a pillow, a pillow made out of the same faux fur, just to test <laughs> it out. And it was this really cool fox embroidery design from Urban Threads. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it was great just to test it because I had to. Um, I believe what I, the reason I was embroidering on it was for an online class I was I was doing on that was mm-hmm. a fabric based. Uh, uh, class and so it's like okay oh i better have a faux fur sample for this so <laughs> here it comes <laughs> well, can we, can we talk a minute about stabilizers though so for that project in particular the fur um 
weight wise or do you have any tips on how to stabilize that um, besides the topper that we just talked about or underneath did you yeah, well, you know, in the 80s, they used to say, you can never be too rich or too thin. <laughs> so, you know, in embroidery land, you can never have too much stabilizer. <laughs> so, yeah, it's stabilizer. It's better better to have too much than too little, absolutely, because too little stabilizer is what where you really find yourself having what we call poor registration. When I say registration, what I mean is, if you have, an, say, a fill design and then you have an outright line on, along the fill and it, if, there, if there isn't enough stabilizer to support those stitches and keep the fabric from being pulled in by the thread tension, uh, the, the outline stitches won't actually land in the right spot. So the, the top culprit for that is inadequate stabilizer. Mm -hmm. So for me, usually the, the answer to the stabilizer question is layers, layering. So... For example, I use a lot of cutaway stabilizer, um, which is what's most appropriate for knits. It's great for the jeans and things. But I don't use, it's not the, it's not your grandmother's cutaway. It's, <laughs> it's not the boardy, nasty stuff we used to have. Because once upon a time, I avoided cutaway like yeah. everything yeah. because it was horrible. It was horrible stuff. But now we have uh, whisper web mesh, all these beautiful sheer, very kind of almost sheer cutaways and things. And so I find two or three layers of that gives a lot of stability, but then I can take my pinking shears and I can grade it just like you would grade a collar or anything else. So there's absolutely no show through to the front. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more tacky than seeing an embroidered logo or something. And there's a big <laughs> circle around it. It's like, yeah. oh, looks like you used a really thick cutaway and you just <laughs> kind of, you know, whacked it out of that hoop. Yeah. So, yeah. so the answer is really layers. And yes. I okay. use a lot of, because I lurk, work with a lot of very strange things, I, I use a lot of, um, oh, like like silky, uh, oh, what do they call it? Uh, fabris, sticky fabris, salvi, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or, or um, with Fof, in Fofland, you know, we have our own version. We have Aquamagic Plus. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of different names for it, but it's, it's all kind of the same stuff. Um, the important thing is just to buy really good quality, you know, mm -hmm. and there's several manufacturers, but, you know, buy good quality. But, you know, sometimes I will start with a sticky and I might hoop with the sticky, like as a, just as a layer, um, you know, my cutaway. And then I might be floating one or two, you know, if, if I start to stitch and again, a lot of times, Remember, when you test an embroidery design, you don't have to stitch the whole darn thing out. <laughs> you can skip yeah. around, yeah. try the colors out on a scrap. I don't have to do the whole thing. <laughs> but if, you know, if I look, I'm just like, you know, I'm not real sure. You can always stick and throw another layer under there, throw another layer under there. You know, it's, I just think we, you know, as sewers, we're so pre-programmed to be frugal. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it goes along with it's the sewing true. DNA, doesn't it? I think yeah, so. It, does. Yeah. It, it really does. It goes with the DNA. And, you know, we just, it's like, you know, we have this beautiful embroidery machine we've invested in, and then we don't want to change the needle, buy good thread, or use enough stabilizer. It's just, there's something <laughs> in our DNA. But, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you, you just, you, I'm sorry. You just, if you want beautiful results, you've got to just bite the bullet. <laughs> you just got to use good materials. Well, well that's interesting <laughs> because, you, you know, you're saying that's, that's sort of a thing that people have when they embroider. Is there is there a particular other problem that you find people have trouble with most when they're doing machine embroidery? Is there some, like, standard oh, difficulty that people have? Standard difficulty they have. Um, yeah, there's a lot of choosing the wrong embroidery, you know, for the fabric that okay. they're embroidering on. Uh -huh. uh, ne you know, needles are always a big one. And huh. it's funny because... You know, I, working for Fuff and, and promoting our new multi-needle machine, you know, I've been traveling on a lot. And, you know, it's funny because in the commercial embroidery world, a lot of times they're only using a size 7511 needle uh -huh. in a lot of those machines, which to me, um, with my experience, 20 years of experience in embroidering with a single needle embroidery machine, and also, it's like 7511 is just asking for a lot of distortion because of displacement where the needle hits the fabric if you're sewing on anything other than like a soft knit mm -hmm. you know there's just so much opportunity for that needle to bend when it strikes the fabric and then oh, you get poor okay. stitch quality okay. so to me that just makes me absolutely cringe but what I keep reading so what I'm guessing this is like one of those urban legends it's mm -hmm. kind of like oh you can't sew a silk thread because it'll cut the fabric I think oh, it's one yeah, of those yeah. kind of things yeah um where someone's somehow said it and now everyone it's the gospel truth um because what I hear is, oh, you can't use larger needles because they make big holes in the fabric. Well, I honestly have never seen that as a problem. 
in, I mean, all the massive quantities of embroidery that yeah. <laughs> they do produce. Yeah. In fact, so one problem I have, you know, they're getting thread breakage. Number one, it might be an old needle. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's probably too small in many cases or has the wrong point on it. I yeah. embroider with a lot of top stitching needles. And okay. if I'm getting thread breakage, I'm having a problem. The first thing I do is I swap out my needle and I go up a size. Okay. Because okay. a lot of times people are trying to embroider on fabrics that have texture. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And what will happen if the needle isn't large enough, if the groove on that needle and the eye isn't big enough to protect the thread from the fabric. Yeah. Because it's the texture of the fabric that is shredding their thread. Right. And or they choose yeah. a, um, just like with sewing also too, in terms of choosing the right fabric, uh -huh. you don't want to choose a fabric for embroidery that is too tightly woven. And that's a that's just a rule you can tell anyone in, in mm -hmm. sewing. The more tightly woven a fabric is, the more difficult your time you're going to have sewing it. And embroidery is the same thing. Remember that if you're going to embroider, there has to be room in that weave or knit structure for the thread. Mm -hmm. Plain and yeah. simple. I mean, it makes sense to me because also you're often stitching through quite a lot of other thread, not just the fabric. By Correct. the time you've got the embroidery motif w close to being done and, yeah. and to expect a skinny needle to get in and out of there and, and exactly. not have problems. Yeah. yeah. I think I, the other thing that people should remember is with a sewing machine needle, it's that it's almost like an open tube that holds the thread as yeah. much as just a, it's not like a hand needle. It's not dragging the thread through. It's sort of like inserting it through and somewhat protecting it in that tube. And that's why you need to have the right size so that it can fit inside that little kind of tube of protection. Absolutely. You know, that's the, you know, it's, it's just crazy why, again, you know, mm -hmm. For some reason, needles are one of those things that nobody wants to buy. Yeah. I know when you buy um, a needle, you get or change. Well, yeah. you get five in a package, and you're like, "Oh, I have to go buy another package of five. One time, yeah. I somehow managed to get my hands on a package of a hundred needles that were a, a nice brand, and I think I paid about I don't know twenty dollars or maybe less than that. And yeah. I and they lasted me just a long time, even. And I felt free about changing them anytime I wanted <laughs> because I had another exactly. 90 left. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, yeah. and, you know, being a silk, silk specialist, yeah. that's, you know, in silk sewing world, I'm sorry, but you absolutely positively must right. keep lots and lots of yeah. nice ni microtex needles yes, in various right. sizes yep. because you have no choice. If you want it, if you don't want to be crying while you're sewing, yeah. you have to have good, sharp, mm -hmm. fresh needles. So, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm a needle girl. It's really <laughs> important. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but we're getting close to the end of our time. Yeah, Katrina, we could talk to you for hours. I wanted to ask you about the garments that you brought. We oh. have them in the background here. So okay. I think behind me to my left is a beautiful wool jacket. It is. And you said something about that having a very special uh, place in your oh, heart. Yeah, the, um, well, that was the jacket that I used for the... 2004, even though the preliminary comp competitions were in 2003, but technically the 2004 make, make it with wool competition. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that was uh, th this, that jacket basically is the physical manifestation of a, a major turning point in my life. And especially in my sewing, my sewing world, I, I would not be sitting here, sitting here today if it wasn't for that jacket, because mm -hmm. it, um, it was a very, it was a very difficult time in my life. Uh, it's actually made from scraps uh, from work. So luckily I was working for Nordstrom Product Group at the time. So mm -hmm. I was the raw material liaison. So I worked with all of the design and technical design teams. Mm -hmm. And so when they would be getting rid of all the backlog of mm -hmm. sample fabrics, they would let me know. And I mean, sometimes, I mean, the piece that is the, the um, under sleeve and the very sides of the jacket along the rib cage, there was only, I think, a quarter meter of that fabric, wow. but it was, I think it was 60 inches wide. So the entire thing's made out of scraps, basically dumpster diving at work, <laughs> um, little tiny pieces. I think there's seven different fabrics, um, the, the collar and the little belt or leather. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I made it from scraps cause I, I just could not afford to buy fabric. And in fact, actually even the, uh, the skirt was wool that was donated to me by a coworker for, so oh. I could make, have something to make a skirt out of it. <laughs> And um, so when I won, um, I, I was lucky to win the national contest that year. And so when I won, I mean, we were all, I got the call at work and we were all screaming and crying. And it was just, it was such a team <laughs> effort, you know, yeah. the, it just became the, the uh, kind of symbol of, of, you know, bouncing off the bottom and doing some, and then mm -hmm. immediately after that, well, in fact, that same year, then right before the Sewing and Stitcher Expo in Puyallup, 
I received a call from Joanne Ross, who was the manager at that time. And uh, Joanne is a very, uh, she's a very upfront kind of person. And so the, the co conversation, I'll make it brief. It went basically like this, like, Katrina, we need a model. I'm like, Joanne, I am, I am not, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm five foot 10, but I, I'm not, you know, 36, 26, 36. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'm not super, super small. And she's like, no. You'll be fine. Just show up. You know, I mean, she didn't ask me, can you get time off work? Can you do anything? No. <laughs> no. Oh, no, none of this. I just, but she did tell me how much it paid and I could not, I literally could not afford to say no. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll be there. Um, so I found myself working the style show as a model uh, for the four days um, during So Expo. And of course, who was I modeling for? But all of the, the major names in our sewing industry. Mm -hmm. All of the, the main pattern companies, they were all there, and that's who I was working for. Well, I also had my garment there because when I was done with the official style shows, I had to run across the show to go model on stage for the wool contest. And so I had my garment there with a sash saying, you know, national ambassador, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And so the um, absolutely amazing professionals in our sewing industry realized that I was just faking it you know, as a model, because <laughs> I certainly was faking it, <laughs> and that, because um, I certainly am not, and that I actually was a pretty capable seamstress. Uh -huh. And so they then, things started dramatically changing in my life within mm -hmm. a month or two of that of the show, um, and basically they all became my mentors. Uh, that's great. In the, mm -hmm. the industry. So I, yeah. I really, truly would not be sitting here if it wasn't for that jacket. So... It's it's my most treasured treasured thing, and mm. I didn't realize we we're going to talk about machine embroidery. I could have brought that, but that's okay. <laughs> I just, you know, I brought fabric. I brought wool and silk. You know, good. Oh, enough. that's good. Yes, so it's yes. all good. Absolutely. Yes, and we'll have some pictures of some of your beautiful machine embroidery. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all good. <laughs> and Carol, would you like to take us out of this episode? Oh sure, sure. Thank you, listeners and viewers, for tuning in, and thanks to our guest Katrina for visiting and sharing her expertise. For more great sewing information, please follow Threads on social media. You can visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads. <laughs>